What's going on guys? Welcome to the video. So I originally planned on making this video showing you guys the team that I used to qualify for the world championship this year in this past weekend's Japan National Championship. But if you've been following me on Twitter or even here on YouTube, uh, you may have already found out that I've been unqualified from the world championship just two days after qualifying. So in this video, I am still going to do the team breakdown of what I use to qualify, um, as well as I'll show you guys the rental code as well, in case you guys want to try it out for yourselves. Um, but that will be the second half of this video. In the first half, I want to go over what the heck is actually happening over here in Japan and kind of talk through so you guys are, are more informed about what it is that's going on over here, what the qualification process is, what all exactly happened to cause this entire mess. And then I'll get into, you know, my team as well as, you know, how it did um, and give you guys the rental code. So let's go ahead and start off. I've got Notepad up here. Um, so first is how exactly do you go from, you know, wanting to qualify for nationals and then worlds to, you know, actually doing that. So the first stages over here in Japan, um, believe it or not, I mean, Scarlet and Violet came out, what, in November? Um, <laughs> the qualification system here doesn't even start until I think it was April uh, is when it started so uh, the global challenges um, I'm sure a lot of you guys may have even played in these but we had global challenge one uh, and then we had three in total so global challenge one two and three so we had three global challenges um, these were what determined who the representatives would be at Japan nationals so the top 150 players would then qualify for Japan Nationals. So, uh, and this is also uh, excluding anybody who had already qualified. So basically, if you finished in the top 150 at Global Challenge 1, let's say, and then you did it again at Global Challenge 2, well, your invite would then pass down to, you know, the person below you. Um, likewise, it was, you know, only Japanese players. So if, for example, somebody from America or Korea finished in the top 150 overall, those invites would then pass down. So it was the top 150 Japanese players who hadn't already secured an invite. So in total, that meant that you had 450 players qualified for Japan Nationals. Okay, so at Japan Nationals, we actually had two stages this year. So we had stage one, I'll call it, and we had stage two. So stage one, that is what just took place this past weekend. So stage one was a um, online best of one closed team sheet ladder tournament. So it was like the global challenges. So where it was, you know, online, uh, just best of one, you know, ladder style. You can't see the opponent's team or anything like you can in the official in-person events over in North America and Europe. Um, it was pretty much going to be another kind of global challenge here. And the players that would then end up qualifying for stage two would be the top 64. So top 64 out of what was 450 qualified for stage two. But not only did they just qualify for stage two, these players also qualified for day one at the world championships. So there was a lot on the line in just this one, you know, online tournament. And this tournament was held over six hours and you had a maximum of 20 games that you could play. So and there was a minimum of 10. So you had to play at least 10 and a maximum of 20. So a, a sample size of 10 to 20 games that were best of one closed team sheet uh, would determine an entire country's world's invite. So we already knew heading into this tournament that this whole process is just an absolute disaster. But this is how it's been for the last decade in Japan. Uh, TPC, unfortunately, uh, TPC being the Pokemon company, which is, you know, the head the head guys over in North America and Europe were familiar with TPCI, which is the international branch of the Pokemon company, uh, but they're below uh, the Pokemon company themselves. TPC, they're in charge. TPCI is just a branch uh, of the Pokemon company. So TPC, we have already known that they just do not care about running, you know, any kind of uh, competitive event 
resembling what we have over in North America. They just run, you know, this garbage, um, and they have been for the last decade. So nothing's really changed, um, you know, going into it. We kind of knew it would be a disaster, but it ends up being even worse uh, than we imagined, and I'll get into that. Um, and then stage two, uh, if you qualified through this stage one and made it to stage two, this would then be in person. So it would be an IRL, still best of one, still closed team sheet, but instead of, you know, it's IRL, so it's not a ladder style tournament anymore. It was now, no, not a Swiss tournament. It was double elimination. I'll just call it double elim. So it was a double elimination tournament. So double elimination is fine, I think. And when it comes to uh, valuing the stream side of things, I think double elimination is fine. Um, but it's going to end up being a huge problem, uh, which I'm going to talk about <laughs> in a bit based off of what actually ended up happening in stage one and how they're addressing it. Um, the fact that it's double elimination is actually terrible. Um, but basically at this stage two, if you finished in the top eight, then you qualified for day two of worlds. So let's see, can you guys see what's my head in the way there? I think you guys can see. Okay. Um, so that's the breakdown of how you would then go from starting out over in Japan to qualifying for nationals to then getting to worlds and the different stages in between. So, uh, as you can see, this entire process of qualifying for worlds is entirely online, entirely best of one close team sheet. They're all ladder style tournaments. I mean, it's just a disaster, but the first three global challenges, they ended up fine. I mean, there were no issues. Um, I mean, there were, I guess I shouldn't say that. I, I even suffered some. I, I think I even tweeted about one, which is the, gen the general kind of bugs that this game has, uh, which are unavoidable, unfortunately. This game just, upon release, and even to this day, is still uh, littered with bugs, um, which uh, we'll talk more about at this stage one portion. But overall, um, the global challenge portion was fine, right? I mean, top 150 is a lot, and you had three opportunities. Really, you had six opportunities, because you could enter with both Scarlet and Violet, so you really had six chances to try and qualify, and top 150 is pretty doable, so um, this part went pretty smoothly, I would say. All right, so stage one was what happened this past weekend. Um, when I made my video saying that I qualified for Japan Nationals, it was this stage one that I was referring to. Um, when I made my video breaking down my team, uh, that was the Global Challenge 2, where I did finish in the top 150 with that Storm Drain Tatsugiri team. Uh, and I have that video on my YouTube channel for anybody you know who's interested and hasn't seen it yet. But stage one was what I played in this past weekend. And so... I had been practicing on Showdown. Uh, I got two teams into the top 64 on the Showdown ladder, and I was like, okay, I'm still not really super confident in my team, but this is good enough, I guess. I'll, I'll give it my best shot. So it came time for the day of the event. Uh, I actually couldn't start until two hours after it already started because I was busy coaching. I had some coaching sessions at that time, but um, as soon as I was ready to play, I saw it was just going crazy on Twitter, even on Discord. I saw some messages from friends who had, uh, you know, been sharing information about what was, what had been going on to this point. And there were issues of, you know, facing up against the same opponent, you know, two, three, even reports of six times in a row, um, which is crazy. But then even more importantly were the actual bugs that, uh, you know, were plaguing this tournament. First of which, and I tweeted about this, um, normally in these online tournaments, at the completion of a match, you get this prompt saying, would you like to continue battling? And you can choose either yes, and that will queue you up for another game, or no, if you need to take a break, you know, get some water, eat, use the bathroom, whatever. This tournament did not have that option. You were immediately forced into queuing for another match. Um, now, there was a way to um not automatically queue and that was shutting off your game but uh shutting off your game obviously you know there's a little bit of risk there right you don't want to get a loss counted against you um but you ultimately kind of had to to do that at a certain point if you had a good enough record where you could risk getting a loss assigned to you and then you know disconnect your game close your game um before that you actually connect with an opponent uh, so you eventually, you know, had to do that in most scenarios. Um, but the fact that you 
could not stop to use the bathroom or anything. That was a definitely a problem for me. Um, I had to go really badly twice actually during uh, this entire tournament and it was very uncomfortable for multiple matches where I just I didn't want to like you know take the switch out of its dock because I didn't know if that would just disconnect me and then maybe that would give me a loss you know as it turns out disconnecting <laughs> didn't actually give you a loss in this tournament which I'll, I'll get to but uh yeah I was kind of worried I didn't want to disconnect so I just kept it in the dock um I didn't really have time I just eventually I found time um and I actually got kind of lucky uh because I locked in my team against somebody I had played three times in a row and so I locked in my team ASAP and then went to go use the bathroom and then ran back uh, to my desk to play. And the leads had already been sent out. And so if my opponent would have sent out something with booster energy, I would have completely missed what stat got boosted. Um, so luckily he didn't. But uh, yeah, it was basically that was how you had to <laughs> go use the bathroom if you needed to. So uh, yeah, it was uh, pretty terrible, needless to say. Um, but as I alluded to, there was an issue with disconnections in this tournament. Um, if you disconnected, then the match would just not be counted. And there was a minimum of 10 games that you had to play. And so there were players who played 10, even there were cases of 11 games. But if they, with records of like, you know, 9 and 2, 9 and 1, which were clearly good enough to qualify for stage 2 and for Worlds, but because they had one or two disconnects, those matches didn't count. And so in the case of like nine and one, okay, you drop down to eight and one, that's still good enough to qualify, but it doesn't meet the minimum of 10 games in order to have your results counted. And so, you know, those players just didn't get a final ranking. And, you know, you can make the case that, uh, you know, okay, you're nine and one, you've got a 90% win rate, you know that you've had a disconnect, you know, the game's buggy, you know, like there's a chance that that game just isn't counted. And so you might as well just queue up again, because even if you lose, your record is probably still good enough to qualify. You can make that case, but it's still just, you know, for me, I, I want to put the blame squarely on, I don't even know who it is, the Pokemon Company, Game Freak, maybe both. Um, I think that's where the blame really goes, right? You can argue, okay, the player could have made a more strategic decision to queue up again, knowing that they had disconnects, but it's like, you just can't have the world invites for an entire country come down to something that is littered with bugs, uh, is just my take. So that was another very unfortunate thing. And compounding with that is the fact that you couldn't see how many games you played and what your current rating is, which you normally can, right? In the Global Challenge, it'll tell you, okay, you've played, you know, 16 games, your rating is 1673 or, you know, whatever. And so if it was displayed, you would know that, okay, my disconnect actually didn't count. So rather than just guessing like, okay, did it count? Did it not count? I don't know. It would have actually told you so you would know to queue up again. And again, you could, you know, kind of know like I might as well queue up again because even if I lose, my record's probably still good enough and I have such a good win rate anyway. You know, might as well queue up just to minimize the chances of, you know, missing out on stage two and day one of Worlds just because of how buggy the game is. But it's like, come on, you, you just cannot have a game this buggy uh, being used to determine an entire country's world's invites. I mean, it's just so unfortunate, but that's what happened after the event. I mean, Japanese players went wild on Twitter. Uh, there were so, so many public complaints and justifiably so. It was even in the news in Japan, um, pretty mainstream news outlets even covering this. Um, and so that, and, and rightfully so really, this tournament was an absolute disaster. And it's been horrible for decades, uh, one decade, just one decade. <laughs> um, it's been horrible for so long. Um, I would have loved to see eventually this changing. Hopefully this was the impetus. I was thinking, you know, okay, this tournament was a disaster. Maybe next year TPC will finally fix things. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't look to be the case. Um, they have decided to fix things, um, but we'll get into what exactly they're doing. Um, but basically on Monday after this tournament, this tournament was held on Sunday. So on Monday, they sent out an email saying, we've noticed that there were a lot of issues with the tournament. We've gotten a lot of support tickets. Um, we're going to investigate. We want to let you know that we're not going to invalidate the results of this tournament, but we may take additional countermeasures uh, or even additional 
measures to address these issues. And so I was like, okay, then, you know, that's fine. Uh, that's pretty much what I would do here. The players who qualified from this tournament, right? Everybody was playing under the same awful situation of having to repeatedly queue up. The top 64 players who qualified for stage two in day one of Worlds, you can't just take that away. I mean, those players earned it. Um, and so what I would do is, okay, those top 64 players, they keep their day one invite. They still qualify for stage two of Japan Nationals. But, you know, this tournament was a disaster littered with bugs. So we're going to hold an additional online tournament the way it should have been held originally. You know, it can be another online best of one closed team sheet ladder style tournament. That's fine. We'll hold another one. And this time, you know, maybe 16, 32, 64. I don't know how many players, you know, it's up to the venue size and, you know, how many people can fit. Um, both for Japan Nationals and for Worlds, um, but X number of players, then you give additional spots to, right? That's what they could have done. You don't take away the top 64 players who earned it, their spots, um, but <laughs> that's what they ended up doing. Um, so they said they wouldn't invalidate the results, but that's essentially what they ended up doing. So I'm still qualified for stage two here, as are all of the other top 64 players. Um, we're still qualified for stage two, but we now no longer have our day one world's invite. And so what's happening now is they're holding an additional tournament here, same as you know it was before, but online, best of one, closed team sheet, for the remaining, what's that, 386 players um, that didn't qualify for stage two. They're holding another one of these tournaments for them in, I think it's two weeks from now maybe. Um, and then the top 64 from that tournament will also qualify for stage two. So now we've got 128 players competing in stage two. However, there's still only going to be 64 players qualifying for Worlds. So essentially what they've done is invalidate this stage one results. Um, you no longer have your Worlds invite and now you have to rely on stage two. And that gets to the problem of <laughs> stage two, which is it's a double elimination tournament with best of one closed team sheet. And so what it does is it comes down to three games. You know, I thought stage one was awful because you have a sample size of 10 to 20 games deciding an entire country's world's invites. Little did I know that it could actually get even worse because now, now it comes down to three games of best of one closed team sheet. I mean, who knows who you get paired against? You could just get unlucky with pairings, get unlucky because Pokemon is just a naturally luck filled game. Or you could just play some, you know, some of the uh, typical best of one closed team sheet cheese that you might normally find. Um, so basically, your first three games, you have to go at least two and one uh, if you want to qualify for Worlds. So, yeah, uh, when it comes to variance, there is an insane amount of variance. Um, it's not like they decided, okay, we're going to have a Swiss tournament, and so... Okay, the top 64 out of 128 at a Swiss tournament, I mean, okay, seven rounds, go four and three. I mean, that feels a lot better as a player, you know. Okay, so I have to win more games than I lose, that's the goal. But now it's like, it all comes down to just three games and that's it. So, pretty awful, extremely disappointing, frustrating to say the least. I don't know if it's going to change from here, but... Just wanted to let you guys know that this is what's going on over in Japan. And honestly, it's not just Japan. Uh, this happened, the same thing happened over in Korea. Uh, there are a number of other countries over in Asia that have been suffering from TPC's handling of competitive Pokemon for years. Um, and so, yeah, this is all very, very frustrating, very unfortunate. We'll see what they do. We'll see if they're able to give more uh, inv uh, invitations to day one of worlds. Um, now it certainly doesn't seem that way. I think there's issues with venue size, which makes sense. I mean, it's so densely populated in Japan. And so the building might not be as big as maybe some other venues might be, uh, in other parts of the world, but yeah, we'll see what happens, but it certainly doesn't look good, but Hey, if I can qualify for Worlds in Stage 2, at least that's content, right? I mean, who else can say they've qualified for Worlds twice in one year? Um, but it looks like that's what I'm going to have to do at this point. Um, so, yeah, that's going to be it for this part of the video. So now it's time to get into some of the stuff that is maybe a little more upbeat that I was originally planning to make this video about. So let me pull up 
Oh, not that. Um, here we go. Let's pull up Showdown here and give you guys a breakdown of the team that I used to qualify. So, uh, as you guys can see here, we've got Dondozo, Tatsugiri, Obama Snow, Bundle, Dragonite, Ting Lu. This is a snow team. That's right. This is a snow team that I used to qualify for Worlds. And it's actually a Terra Ice Dondozo. So, uh, that was one of the things that... Honestly, it's kind of the only crazy thing about the team. Not even that it's crazy, but uh, when you think of Terra types that Dondozo uses, uh, Grass is a common one, Poison, Steel, or some nice defensive types too. And you'll even sometimes see Fire as a way to super effective hit Amoongus and Wochian. I guess Flying is another one that you might see sometimes. Uh, the benefit of Fire is it's immune to burn. But I decided to go with Ice since I was rocking a Snow team. I was like, you know what? If I'm going to try and qualify, I want to do it in style, you know, it makes better content. So I'm going to go with Terra Ice Dondozo. It fits the theme of the team. Uh, and I did not click it a single time <laughs> during the actual tournament. But uh, in practice, I did use it sometimes. And obviously in best of one, uh, Amoonguses usually aren't going to go for the Terra Water immediately. So you're able to catch them off guard with this, which is nice. And you get the defense boost from snow which is actually really nice uh the damage i took from some like iron hands and great tusks under snow and especially with aurora veil up i mean it, it was honestly comical so uh dundozo even though i was running an extremely offensive ev spread it can get extremely bulky with the help of obama snow so uh decided to go for terra ice it was just more style points so I went with it, and luckily it didn't come back to bite me. But in practice, I mean, it was fine for best of one kind of tournaments. Um, in terms of the move set, though, pretty standard: Wave Crash, Earthquake, Terra Blast, Protect. Uh, I had thought about Substitute just because uh, Moongus is kind of annoying. Will O Wisp can be annoying, but in practice, I found that I really needed Protect, and I didn't want to get rid of any of the other coverage moves. So that's what I went for. Um, leftovers, I felt was good because I had the Obama Snow, giving Dondozo extra bulk in the form of Aurora Veil. And if I went for Terra Ice too, uh, then it gets extra bulk from the Snow, boosting its defense. So I went with Leftovers. And then for the ability, I went with Oblivious because Intimidate is very common. Gyarados is rising a lot in usage. And I just wanted to make sure that I couldn't get stalled out and taken advantage of with Dondozo just by spamming Intimidates. And because I'm running so much speed and attack, I can outspeed and one-hit KO Arcanines, uh, you know, one-hit KO Amoonguses that don't Terra. Um, you know, even Gyarados doesn't really do too much. Like, it can T-Wave me, but that's about it. Um, and so I just liked having, you know, this offensive set backed up by Aurora Veil vale and having the ability to just go through Intimidate. So uh, this was a Dondozo, pretty standard. Um... And since I'm running Oblivious and an offensive set, you can already tell that I switched from Storm Drain, which is what I used when I qualified for Japan Nationals to begin with, switched back to Commander Tatsugiri. So here I ran a Life Orb set, which uh, you don't really see too much. Um, I actually wanted to run Specs, but I had it already on Iron Bundle, which was more important. So I just gave it Life Orb. I wanted it to do more damage against things that were maybe slower, your more balanced style of teams. Which was also why I gave it a bunch of speed investment um, so that it could outspeed a lot of those, you know, mid tier kind of Pokemon and really hit them hard with, you know, Life Orb boosted Dracos, Muddy Waters. And then I had Dragon Pulse because in these tournaments I wanted something with 100% accuracy. So I added Dragon Pulse. Um, and Terra Water was just, you know, if you're staring down a Freeze Dry or dazzling gleam or whatever and then it can also boost damage against things like arcanine to get you the ko there so that was the set the defensive evs were just to survive um chien pao ice spinner so that i wouldn't die immediately um but usually that's kind of what happens to tatsugiri it either gets put to sleep by amoongus or just ko'd but I figured, you know, maybe Dondoza would just be killing Amoonguses, and if Tatsugiri can land safely, especially into maybe some of the balance style teams, then this type of Tatsugiri can actually put in some work. So that was the Tatsugiri I went for. Moving on to Obama Snow. So here, decided to go for a Focus Sash set, since 
I had been testing so many different Obama Snow sets. I tried Citrus Berry with a lot of bulk. I tried Citrus Berry with, you know, even a significant amount of special attack investment. I tried Light Clay. Uh, and of course, I tried Focus Sash. I tried a bunch of different moves too. Tried out Protect, tried out Ice Shard, tried out, I even tried out Giga Drain. I tried out a bunch of stuff. Um, but ultimately, what I decided to go for, I knew I wanted Helping Hand. Because with Specs Iron Bundle, the fact that you can pick up a one-hit KO on bulky Flutter mains, I think was really important. Uh, that came up a bunch in my practice games on Showdown. So I knew I wanted Helping Hand, and I also knew that I wanted Aurora Veil because, you know, I, oftentimes I found myself leading Don Dozo Obama Snow. And if you can get off an Aurora Veil and set up Don Dozo under the Aurora Veil, I mean, it is just so tough to deal with. A lot of teams, really, they rely on, you know, Freeze Dry from Bundle, maybe Chi Yu, maybe Fluttermane, and just kind of, you know, hitting it hard with a lot of damage as their way to deal with it. But if you get that Aurora Veil up, I mean, it is just, it takes so long to just kill Don Dozo, especially with Leftovers. So uh, I knew I wanted those two moves, and then Blizzard Energy Ball just filled it out. Decided to go Focus Sash just to guarantee my survival. Um, I had tried other spreads. I mean, the fact that Snow buffs its defense now... That makes it so bulky. Um, you can survive Great Tusk close combat. I ran, I ran spreads that could do that um, during testing. I mean, this thing can become super, super bulky, which is really nice. I just decided to go with the Focus Sash set, but the others, it's not like they were bad. The others were also really good. I just felt like this one suited my team a little bit better. Um, but I went with Terra Ghost. Uh, this actually came up during the tournament. Um, since I'm Sash, I figured, okay, I mean, maybe something comes up and I don't have Protect. Maybe something comes up where I need to avoid an Extreme Speed or Fake Out or something. Uh, but it actually did. There was one game I had in Obama Snow with like 40 HP left and it was poisoned. And all I had to do was get up an Aurora Veil and I was staring down a Dragonite. And so I turret ghosted, set up the Aurora Veil, and then, you know, poison just ended up killing me later. But I was able to pull it out, pull the match through with what I had in the back thanks to that Aurora Veil. Um, it really came and clutched that match. So Terra Ghost actually ended up working out pretty well for me. Um, but if I was running a bulkier Obama Snow, I would go for a different Terra type. You know, something like Water, I think, would be better. Um, there are a number of different options, but for me, with Focus Sash, decided to go for Ghost. Uh, all right, moving on to Bundle. So Bundle is um, pretty crazy with Choice Specs, Terra Ice, um, it can do an insane amount of damage, especially when backed up by Helping Hand. Blizzard being a spread move, and with how good Ice is as an offensive type, um, this thing just gets out of hand. If the opponent doesn't have speed control, or doesn't have, you know, Choice Scarf Pokemon, or Booster Energy boosting speed on Pokemon, this thing can just absolutely run through teams. So, um, moveset-wise, Blizzard, Freeze Dry, Hydro Pump, Water Pulse. So, again... The only reason for Water Pulse was uh, I wanted something with 100% accuracy as a water move because Hydro Pump, obviously, I hate it. Uh, I never want to click it, but unfortunately, I did actually have to click it uh, in the tournament. So uh, luckily, it didn't fail me, um, but it just as easily could have failed me. Um, but I did also click Water Pulse. There were times where if you're able to chip things low enough, then Water Pulse is enough to get KOs. But against like full HP Arcanine or Chiyu, you just have to go for Hydro Pump. But if you can just chip them, you know, if, if you hit them with a Blizzard on a Switch-In or something with a Bomb of Snow, I mean, then they can become in range for Water Pulse. So uh, that's why I had Water Pulse. If something ever got chipped where I needed to hit it, that's what I went for. You know, things that would resist ice. So, you know, your Fire types, your Golden Ghosts, things like that. So it did come up. Um, so I'm glad I had it. But if I was playing in a different event entirely, maybe I would consider something like Sleep Talk. That might also be pretty decent. Um, but for me, in this style of tournament, I really wanted something that was 100% accurate. So that's why I went with Water Pulse. Um, I guess not really too much else to talk about with Bundle. Um, oh, I guess I could mention I had also tested Booster Energy, but you really just need the specs um, for damage. At least for me, I wanted it to be... Uh, I want it to be my main damage dealer, because when you look at the rest of the team, right, Obama Snow not really doing too much damage, Ting Lu not really do, doing too much damage, Dragonite and Dozo are both physical, I wanted at least something doing some pretty sizable special damage, especially spread, so that's why I went with Specs. Uh, moving on to Dragonite, this is exactly the same Dragonite that I used 
previously. So same EV spread and everything. Uh, so this will survive Qianpao High Spinner, uh, even through my, uh, multi scale, even if I don't Terra. So that also again came up. So um, I really am liking this EV spread. Uh, of course, you're missing out a little bit on speed, but for me, because I'm the Terra normal E speed, uh, I didn't really miss the speed too much. So um, that's my EV spread, same as before. If you saw my last video with the uh, uh, Storm Drain Tatsugiri. And then the moveset I changed a little bit. I added Facade. Uh, facade, I never ended up clicking it. Even in practice, I really didn't click it very much at all. But um, honestly, it was just a filler fourth move uh, so that I could bring it against like Talonflame style Tailwind teams. And if they ever burned me, then I could switch Dragonite out, switch it back in, go for Facade. Um, so it came up like a little bit in practice, but not really too often. Uh, Aerial Ace and Low Kick definitely came up a lot in practice and in the tournament so extreme speed aerial ace low kick i think are um kind of definites for a dragonite they're both they're all really good um the reason i went with facade over you know stomping tantrum was because i had ting lu and a lot of times i did pair dragonite with ting lu i think they go really well together and so i already had my ground coverage from ting lu i didn't feel the need for dragonite to go for stomping tantrum and even dozo has earthquake so I felt like I could afford dropping the ground coverage to just give myself a little bit of extra insurance against burns. So uh, that's the Dragonite. And then last up, we've got Ting Lu. So Ting Lu was really good for me. I ran an Assault Vest set. I really like AV on Ting Lu. Um, it just makes it so bulky and it affords you EVs that you can put into its attack uh, so that it can actually do a pretty sizable amount of damage. So. Uh, love the Assault Vest set. I went with Terra Poison. It's just, in general, a great defensive type in this metagame. And it does also protect you from uh, Glamora. So uh, that was the reasoning for that. Move set wise Earthquake, Stomping Tantrum, Ruin Nation, Heavy Slam. Since I'm Assault Vest and I wasn't like maxing out on attack, I wanted Ruin Nation. It's also nice into Dondozos. Uh, you know, it's not like I'm unaware. So um, my. Bringing my own Dondozo into opposing Dondozo teams can sometimes be a little risky, so I did find myself, depending, you know, on the composition of their Dondozo team, if they were like Dondozo, Tatsugiri, and then a bunch of the special attackers like Flutter, Chiyu, Bundle, then, you know, sometimes the group of four I would bring would be the Obama, Bundle, Dragonite, Tinglu. You know, not necessarily in that order, but I would bring both Dragonite and Tinglu to that match. And so... Because, you know, if they were to bring Don Dozo, I wanted to have Ruin Nation here. Um, it's nice against Dozos. It's nice against Ting Lu. You can chop down Lemuras, uh, especially if they're AV. Sometimes they can be a little tricky to deal with. Um, and it also doesn't trigger those toxic spikes. Uh, it's overall just a, a pretty solid move. So I liked having Ruin Nation, even despite the pretty sizable attack investment. But Earthquake pairs really well with Dragonite. Again, since I was leading... Uh, or not leading, but pairing Dragonite and Ting Lu a lot together, uh, I thought I could afford getting the spread damage on Earthquake. So Earthquake was really nice to have, and then Stomping Tantrum in case Ting Lu was out alongside something else, um, which there were definitely times where I would lead Dozo Ting Lu, for example, and so sometimes I would need the Stomping Tantrum single target uh, ground type move. So that was good to have. Also, there were a lot of times where the boosted power came in handy, where Ting Lu might get flinched, for example, or maybe miss Ruin Nation. There were times where Stomping Tantrum could get that double power boost, and that would be really impactful. So I uh, was glad to have both Earthquake and Stomping Tantrum. And then Heavy Slam, not really an explanation needed there. It hits Flutter Main. Um, if there's opposing snow teams, it can be good there. So not even necessarily good, but it's at least, you know, decent. Um, so... Yeah, that's the Ting Lu set. In terms of how the team plays, I would say the most common leads were you know, Dragonite Ting Lu as a lead was very common with Obama Snow Bundle in the back or with Dozo Tatsugiri in the back. I think Dozo Obama Snow was also a, a very common lead I would go for. That way I could threaten, you know, either protect on Dozo and set up an Aurora Veil or sometimes I might even just switch out Obama Snow for Tatsugiri if, if you know, there was an opening to just immediately go for Dondozo combination. Um, that was an option because then you could also switch out Obama Snow um, so that you can preserve the snow for late game alongside your own bundle. 
so that when they finally do get rid of Dozo Tatsugiri, you know, you can reset the snow with Obama Snow, uh, bring in Bundle and just spam Blizzards late game after you've already kind of chipped away at things with your own Dondozo. So that was an effective combination. Uh, there were some times where I would just lead the Bomb of Snow Bundle and go with Dragonite Ting Lu in the back. Um, that wasn't as frequent, but there were times where I felt like the Dragonite Ting Lu were kind of the keys to winning, and so I wanted to preserve them for late game. So that was kind of how I would decide my uh, matchups with the team. In terms of best of one versus best of three open team sheet, uh, the only thing here that really benefits from the closed team sheet is just this Terra Ice on Dondozo, but the thing is, I feel like that makes such a huge difference where in a best of three event, I just could not run this team exactly. Um, I think you would have to change Dondozo, at least in some way. I mean, I think good players can just take advantage of this too easily. And that was also kind of my issue and the reason I didn't have as much confidence in the team heading into the tournament was I could tell just from piloting the team, like, I think good players could kind of exploit this team. But luckily, in a best of one setting, and, you know, it's not like everybody you play is going to be, you know, an absolute top tier opponent, because uh, there were 450 players invited. Um, and again, it's not like every team is going to have a Dondozo answer, because you just, you can't make a team that just covers for everything. And a lot of times the conventional uh, conventional Dondozo answers are things like Palafin with Haze, Amoongus, you know, the uh, special attackers like Fluttermane and Chiyu. And so I felt like the rest of my team could kind of handle those. So, um, yeah, I felt like it was a pretty solid team, but again, it, I felt like I knew that there were some kind of weaknesses that good players could exploit. I just didn't get them exploited in this tournament, so luckily I was able to qualify for Worlds. And unluckily, then I unqualified for Worlds. So, uh, yeah, that's the team I used to do it. Let's go ahead and pull up the... Uh... Oh, geez, there's nothing on the screen. Uh, hold on, I'm going to have to get a cutscene in here and pull this uh, switch up so you guys can get the rental code real quick. All right, so guys, here is the rental team. If you're interested in trying out the team yourself, you can feel free. Rental team is there in the top right. So feel free to try the team out for yourselves. Um, but that's going to do it for this video. Man, I think I've been talking for a while. I don't know how many minutes it, it's been. But thanks, guys, if you've stuck around all the way till the end. I appreciate it. Um, but let me know down in the comments, what are your thoughts on Snow in this format right now? Because it's really picked up in popularity quite a bit these past couple of weeks. Um, and so it's kind of the trend right now. But... You think it's going to continue to be the trend? Do you think people finally give it the respect that it deserves? And so we start to see the decrease in snow teams as people start to adjust their team to be able to counter it a little better. Let me know, but subscribe if you're not already, and I'll see you in the next video.